everyone. Welcome to another episode of an incredible talk show brought to you by the Indian Football Court. Today we have with us a player who has played at the Olympics and FIFA World Cup. He has also played in the African Cup of Nations and World University Leagues. He is the first and only player to start his career in the I League and make it to the World Cup. He has played for East Bengal, Bangladesh, and Mohanbagh. He is the only player to play in three Asian countries, five European countries, both North American countries, and what South American country. He has also coached over six clubs. I'm glad to welcome Mr. Emeka Iziogu. Hello, sir. How are you doing? I'm all right. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's so good to have you over here. We finally get to have you over here in person. And let's see how it goes. Ryan, you can take it over. Great. Another delightful day for me because I'm getting to interview someone who has been one of the top foreign players to ever play in India and perhaps one of the most successful because, as I just mentioned, um, the first player to start in the I-League and uh, make it to the FIFA World Cup. Emeka, sir, I would say that a testimony to the fact that you're the most straight-talking individual in football. Today's uh, interview is going to be quite exciting with the kind of questions. It's going to be very spicy. And I look forward to have, uh, to taking this interview. And uh, thank you for accepting our invitation. Just fire away. I'm down. So, how are you and where are you? I'm all right. Thank you. Uh, right now, I'm in, the, I'm in the United States of America. I'm in the state of Texas uh, visiting a friend of mine. Okay, great. So uh, your journey started uh, from Punjab University and you went all the way to the FIFA World Cup. What made you come to India initially and uh, how did your footballing journey begin? Um, I, had, I have a cousin of mine who's a little bit older than me. Um, when he was uh, in 1981, he was about to leave Nigeria and go to Chandigarh to study in the University of uh, Punjab. And he told me he was coming to India. I said, okay, when you get there, if it's good, let me know so I can come and join you. And he got to India within, if you remember those days, it was letter writing that we used to connect each other and our phones and all that, you know. So he got to Chandigarh, he liked what he saw in Punjab University, sent me a letter and said to me, just come right away, it's a good place, you'll like it. And that's how I came to India. Wow, that's good. So you've, uh, you managed with it, despite the, the issues with communication that aren't present today. And you have played for the big three clubs in Kolkata, East Bengal, Mohan Bagan and uh, Mohammedan Sporting. So how was your experience in each club and which one gives you the fondest memories? Um, uh, I, I, just, I just didn't go to Kolkata like that, you know. I... I played most mostly within the northern part of India, you know. And uh, with Chandigai 11, I played in a DCM tournament. I played in Duran tournament, you know. And um, from playing in those tournaments, uh, East Bengal was one of the first clubs that saw me and they came to they came to Chandigarh and took me to Calcutta. That's how I got to Calcutta, to play in Calcutta. And um, obviously, I played for the three clubs. Uh, but um, uh, playing in East Bengal was, um, it was a peculiar experience because I never played as a striker, you know. But... Um, they, uh, I mean, Sham Tapa, who was the coach at that time, insisted that I should play as a striker for him. So I said, I've never played as a striker. He said, don't worry. I'll take care of that. And to his credit, 
every day we finish training. He keeps me back in the in the in the field and keeps Baska Ganguly in the field. And Baska will be in goal and I will be taking shots at goal. You know, he'll be throwing the balls from all sides of the field to me and I'll be hitting it in the in the goal, you know. And um in my first year in uh, in Calcutta in East Bengal, I I came up as a top scorer also, you know. Thanks to uh, Sham Tapa who took his time also to uh, continue to coach me on how to score goals and how to uh, develop as a good striker, you know. So that's how my story was, and that's how I started to play as an attacker in India, but. Eventually, when I came to Muhammad Sporting, I told the coach, hey, I'm a midfield player. Let me play in the midfield. You'll be surprised what you see. And when I came in, when, when they allowed me to play in the midfield, they saw every part of my football that was hidden that you cannot see if I was playing as a striker, you know? So my experience, in those two clubs were outstanding, but most memorable was my experience with Mohamed Sports Club, you know, because I played where I was comfortable and I was able to uh, I play extremely well. That's great, and it definitely is a contribution of the of the coach as well as your versatility as a player. Now, you have also been at Goa, so... If you were to compare, I mean, what's the football culture like over there consider, in comparison to Calcutta, com considering that both are powerhouses in Indian football? Um, I didn't play. I didn't play actually in Goa. I coached in Goa. I coached the uh, Churchill Brothers. And my experience at Churchill Brothers, uh, um, it would have been... It would have been a fantastic experience. But Churchill's brother, junior brother, uh, made a mess of the whole thing. The league had not started. I league had, had not started. We went to a tournament in, in Delhi. We played in the final and we lost to a team I can't remember the name, one of the big teams in India, we lost to them 2-1. And we returned to Goa. Churchill uh, had an oppression on his knee. He was in uh, Bombay. He had his oppression in Mumbai. And um, his junior brother just came and served me a letter and said that I'm fired. So I was like, you're kidding. He was like, yes, I'm fired. And I just packed my bags and returned to America. Two weeks later, Churchill returned to Goa and he was asking about me. They told him that they fired me. And Churchill was mad with his brother. His brother, as stupid and dumb as he is, he didn't know that Churchill made a good decision to bring me to the team. You know, and it was for the best interest of the team. And if they wanted to improve, that was the moment. And his brother fired me. And he didn't know that Churchill had already paid me more than $100,000 half of my salary, I mean like uh, uh, six months of my salary I had, he paid me. Because I, I, know, I know the way things work in India. I have experienced a lot in India, you know, with regard to contracts. So I insisted, I told Churchill, I'm not gonna coach you until you pay me six months of my salary, you know, I had. And he did that. That's when I signed the contract, you know. But his brother, he, didn't, he wasn't even up to one month and his brother just kicked me out of the club. So I left the club with over 
And church was calling me to return, to come back. I told him, no, I'm not going to come back. You know, because the management right there is negative. So there's no point for me to come back to be in the same mess that his brother is creating, you know? So I refused to come back. So that's how, that's how I left in the football, you know? But there's so much mismanagement in Indian football. It is shameful even to talk about, you know? Right. So um, the rumors were at that time that uh, it was because of a fallout with uh, the star striker Odafa for five, uh, in your five months. Is it true or not? Um, there wasn't, I would not call it a fallout. Odafa was an important player of the team. But he wanted Felix, another Nigerian. There's only two, two foreigners that can play at that time. You know? So they had three foreign players. One, uh, three of them are Nigerian. One was playing as a midfielder for me. And he was even a better player for me, for the team, more than Odafe. Because he was doing most of the dirty jobs. I can't remember his name. He's a Nigerian. Only two foreign players can be in the field. Odafo was always wanting Felix to start. And I told him, Felix is not better than that, that other Nigerian. That the other Nigerian is a better player for the team. And he must play. He must be in every starting 11. Because I knew his quality, you know. So that's why I was playing the guy always. Even some matches, I'll put Odafo on the bench. But that guy would start, you know. Felix wasn't starting because he wasn't good enough in the forward to play, you know. Uh, um, if I play Felix and Odafa and the other Nigerian player is not playing, our midfield will be open completely. And our defense will be exposed. So I knew what I was doing. If Odafa, if Odafa forgets that he is a player and not a coach, I put him on the bench. And the management of Churchill Brothers should support me. But his brother was listening to Odafa. You know, and the local assistant coaches, too, from Goa, they were also against me. So they were working with Odafa, you know? So that's exactly what happened. But the control of the club must be taken by Churchill himself, not his brother, not his wife, not his daughter or his son. He should take charge of his club and run his club. He shouldn't listen to anybody, you know, with regard to running the club. So these are the problems we have in Indian football. And the minute I was sacked, they brought someone from uh, Middle East who brought them a coach from, I think, Brazil or Argentina. I can't remember where he's from. You know, they just brought one coach and I told them that coach is not a good coach. Most Indians, they think that anybody, a rickshaw puller in, in Brazil or, or in Argentina is a good coach or from South America, anybody is a good coach. You know, so that's the problem we have with Indian football. They, they are, they so much worship Europeans and Latin Americans. Anybody, you know, a truck driver or a truck pusher, you know, a, 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 a what's it called? Um, a street, a street person 
in this uh, continent. They can convince Indians that they are, they are good coach, they can coach, and they believe that, and they pay them a lot of money, and they coach them. Now tell me, with all the foreign coaches you guys have in India, where has that taken India football? Think about it. It's because you're making the wrong decisions. There are even Indian ex-internationals, your legendary ex-footballers, who can coach better than those people. But you guys don't pay attention to them. You, 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 just the way, just exactly the way it's been Africa. In Africa, they worship white skin, Europeans, uh, uh, Latin Americans. It's the same thing that's going on. That's why the football in Asia keeps going down. And the ones in Africa also, they're going down. Think about it. No foreign coach has ever won a World Cup. No foreign coach has won a World Cup for another nation. Yeah. So why don't we uh, uh, respect and give attention to coaches that are well knowledgeable about the country they are coaching, about the culture of the players. These things are extremely important. If I'm coaching players from West Bengal, I know how they behave. I know their culture very well. If I take them to play, to go to, say, New Delhi to play, After four or five days of playing, if they, if they don't eat, you know, Bengali food, they start losing touch in football. Uh, you're on mute. Uh, you're, you're on mute. Sorry. Them to Bengali restaurants. So they can have house of Bengali food once in a while. You know? So those things are very important. When you bring an Argentina coach or Brazil coach or European coach, they don't know these things. Right. It's very yeah. impressive that very very impressive that you have got such a good understanding of the Indian culture. Of course, you have started there, but then that also helps with, with coaching for sure. And now, uh, talking about speaking about coaches, Jarnel Singh is someone you really, really, really respect. But on the other hand, you have differing views with uh, the legendary Amal Datta. Can you give us an insight on that? You meant Amal, Amal Dota or Janel yeah. Singh? Which one? Uh, so you have very good things to say about Janel Singh, but not so good things uh, to say and about Janel, Amal Dutta. Janel Singh is uh, probably the most popular player of India, you know, uh, in his time. He, he's a legendary ex-footballer of India. And uh, I was lucky to uh, have met him when I was in Chandigarh, and it's, it was like uh, Sector 17 Stadium in Chandigarh, where I train every morning. Janel Singh comes out there too to train, you know. So he's, he's like family to me, you know. He's a man that saw me play for the first time, and he loved my football, and he was going to watch Every match that I played in northern part of India, every match, it doesn't matter where it is, in Goa, in Kashmir, in um, Amritsar, in Chandigarh, in, I mean, New Delhi, sorry, you know, I mean, all these places, Haryana, uh, uh, Patiala, all those places, doesn't matter. You go there, you travel, go there, watch me play, and when I'm done with playing, Maybe in the evening or the next day, we meet and he'll tell me, 
the areas where I played well and the areas that I didn't play well and things I need to improve and all that, you know. So he was like a mentor for me, you know. He, he was family. And I was in DAV College of Punjab University. He even had to bring his youngest son to DAV College, my college, so that I can mentor his son, you know. Uh, that his son, I think, is in Canada right now. Uh, but um, Janelle was a great guy. He was a really great guy. Then uh, Amal Dutta. Amal Dutta, um, I never had a good experience with Amal Dutta. I came into, I came into play for Mohambagan. He was with Mohambagan. And I think it was only one tournament that I went with his, with his team in in Mumbai, I played two matches. Those two matches, he brought me in from the bench. He didn't, he didn't start me in any of the games, you know? And I found that disrespectful, you know? But again, he's the coach. Decision is all he is. He made his decision, you know? But the decisions didn't favor him. I am a winner. I go out to play. When I go out to play, I go out to win. You know? And I don't, I don't win matches. I have no capacity or have not actually tried it. I have never come from the bench to win matches. You know? I'm a starter. I impress coaches enough for them to start me in the team, you know? So uh, it was a very poor outing for Mohambagan in New Delhi. And right after that, we returned back to uh, Mohambagan and he told the Mohambagan people to fire me. And I got kicked out of the club. So I never even had any like, formal discussion with him. So I don't even know him, you know? I don't know him. The only, the only time I knew him was when I was playing for East Bengal and he was coaching uh, Mohampagan. We won the league. I was a top scorer. So, you know, and when I was playing for Mohamed Sporting Club, Mohamed Sporty Club was the best club in, in, in Kakata when I was playing there. So, so I, I don't, I didn't, I had no experience with him at all, except that experience, which didn't even last for two weeks, you know. Is it? That's it. I have nothing to say about him. I don't have anything positive to say about him, you know. Well, it's interesting that there are so many different experiences in professional football. Speaking about experiences, you had gone into the Nigerian national team in 1987 once, and uh, you had. Uh, pardon? Yeah, so this was 86. So now this is an incident of 1987, if I am not mistaken, where there was a big belief that there was juju, which is. Black magic. Now, how prevalent was black magic in uh, international football at that time? Um, black magic is black magic. Black magic comes from African nations, you know. Uh, uh, the, the, the players who believed in that went for it and perhaps it worked for them or it didn't work for them. I don't know, you know. I have no um, experience about the black magic, you know. I, I am a Christian and I don't believe in those kind of things, you know. Uh, but players, players who were into it went for it and they believed in it. And I mean, you will, you will notice that from the rituals that they do before every game, you know, and even after every game, you know. So the ones that believe in that, 
believed in it. You know, they even kill people for that. For that, you know. Wow. So, yeah. Unbelievable. And um, now, you know, you have always been uh, known to be really, really courageous and straightforward. So, at the 1994 World Cup qualifier against South Africa. you had sent the then sports minister i think his name was alex akinyele you had sent him out of the dressing room when he had come at half time to give a talk so can you narrate go into more detail about that incident um, it's a big thing it's a big thing to send your sports minister out of the dressing room <laughs> yeah we came we came to south africa to play against south africa it was world cup qualifying series was a very important game for nigeria we needed to win that game or at least get a draw um uh johannesburg is in high altitude so when players from uh uh other nations come to play there they lose their breath very easily when they are playing and in that game uh south africa they really pressed us in that game but we held our own and we actually should have won won them we actually scored a goal that was disallowed you know and uh uh a number of my my teammates didn't perform very well you know even though we held south africa uh, i was the only person who had the the stamina and strength to run everywhere i was everywhere in the field in fact i was man of the match in that uh, game you know and it was so difficult so many players had so many difficulties to play the central defenders were calling me to help them the right back and the left back were calling me to help them the left winger victor ikbeba who was playing for monaco at that time you know he was also calling me to come and help him you know these were all players that were tired in the game you know and i was you know running into their areas to help them you know cuz i'm that kind of me feel that 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 plays you know from box to box and that type of player you know so uh first half 00 it was a time for me to talk to the guys in the language they will understand you know and i was waiting for the coach to give his uh uh half time pep talk and all that and all of a sudden he went to the door and opened the door and said the minister and his entourage are coming to speak to us you know and i thought he was joking and the minister and his entourage they all walked into the dressing room and they closed the door I went straight back I went straight back to the door opened it wide widely and screamed at them and I told the minister if you and your your crew don't get out of this place I I will use these bottles here and break them all on your head you guys get the fuck out of this room immediately you know and everybody was like you know nobody believed it and they all started walking out they all walked out you know so i also started abusing the coach why would you bring him in here what's he going to tell us so was we it no we're not playing well as a team only you are you are addressing the team is all we can entertain we cannot entertain even the president of nigeria if he came in there i'm a walk him out you know 
that was the wrong thing. That was the wrong thing to do, you know. And even the coach, his assistants, all of them, they they agreed. Even the captain, everybody agreed that I was right, you know. So that that's what happened. And was uh, uh, are you, are you I mean are you aware of whether the coach brought him into the dressing room or did he tell the coach that he's coming? Um, I don't I don't know. Just the coach opened the door and said that the the uh, minister was coming to address us. You know, that's not what we needed at that time. And did the did the uh, how was your, did you interact with the minister thereafter ever? Did he? Did you come no. across him? Did you cross paths? Never. No. Okay. Now, uh, speaking about uh, uh, about the coach, so Clemens Westeroff, he uh, uh, you had claimed that he had ninety. He was representing 97 percent of of the squad, like you know, as an as an agent kind of thing, um, and that's why he used to try and play them to increase their market value. How prevalent is that in uh, current in football? Um, everything, everything I said about him is, uh, is the truth. Uh, it is wrong for a coach to be agent of his players. And he happened to be agent of about 97 or 98% of the players of that team, you know, and that is the reason why we lost to Italy in the World Cup. That was a World Cup that we should have gone to the finals easy. I don't know what's going to happen in the finals, but we had a team to get to the finals pretty, pretty easy, you know. But because he wasn't using the right players, he was always bringing the players that he can expose in that biggest window so that he can sell those players. And that's exactly what he did. He sold a lot of the players. If you look at that team, immediately after that World Cup, he sold a number of players from that team and he made his money. Right. So, that, that, I mean, it's against the ethics, even FIFA ethics or the ethics of the game is against it, you know, that a coach should be uh, uh, the, the agent of his players. It is wrong. Right. right. And uh, I'm, now my next question is something that's not to do with actual on-field uh, football. So former Bangladeshi centre-back Kaiser Hamid, he was uh, arrested in 2019 and the police had detained you for being in possession of a revolver. What's the truth behind that incident? Um, Nigeria played Argentina in, in Dhaka, Bangladesh. And I was the guest of honor of that match. Bangladesh Football Federation sent me tickets to come to uh, Dhaka for that match to, together with my wife. And Kaisa was my best friend or still my best friend um, when I was playing in Dhaka Mohammed Sporting. Kaisa, you know, he also captained Bangladesh for more than 12 years. He's a legendary player of the country. And when I arrived in Dhaka, he was, um, he was excited, you know, to see me. And he took me with his family to uh, have dinner in a restaurant. We finished having dinner and he told the wife to take the kids back to the house, that he's um, going with me to my hotel so we can spend some time in my hotel before he can go back. So we got to my hotel. My hotel happened to be the same hotel where Argentina is 
the same hotel where Nigeria is. And you are talking about Lionel Messi. Um, what's uh, the, the, the captain of Nigeria? Um, he played for Chelsea. He's the captain of Nigeria. He was in the team too. You know, so there were a lot of great players in that team. So people from Southeast Asia were all in Dhaka to, to see Lionel Messi and Mikel Obi of uh, Chelsea, you know. Now, uh, when we got to the hotel, the roads were closed by the police. Cars cannot get through it. But because of Kaisa and myself, they allowed us to take our car to the hotel. Now, getting a parking space in the, in the hotel, the five-star hotel, massive hotel, you know, no parking space. So Kaisa said to me, okay, Kaisa said to me, okay, you can go down here, right in front of the hotel. Let him find a place where he can park his car. I said, okay. I stepped out of the car and then he gave me a bag. It's just a small bag. He gave me a bag. I took the bag from him. He said, wait for me here. Don't go into the hotel. Remember that if you go into the hotel, they cannot allow, allow me to go into the hotel. That's what he said to me, you know? I said, okay, yeah, yeah, that's true. I will, I will stay outside. So I had to stay outside the hotel to wait for him to come so that I can go into the hotel with him. And immediately there were millions of fans, you know, around the hotel. They noticed me and they started shouting my name, screaming my name and coming to, to me, to mob me, you know, obviously for autograph and selfies and all that. But I didn't want to entertain that because I could get mobbed, you know. So I ran straight to the front of the hotel. They cannot come to the front of the hotel, you know. While I was in the front of the hotel, all the, uh, all the people uh, that work in the hotel, they know me. And they said to me, the security people, they said to me, uh, make a buy that I should come in, you know. So what am I doing outside? I should come in, you know. So I said I'm waiting for a friend of mine. They were like, yeah, you can wait for him inside the the lounge, you know. So I went into the lounge. Now to go into the lounge, they have metal detector. So I gotta. They have they have metal detector. I gotta leave. I gotta leave where where I am right now. My my bar is actually going down. Let me get let me get a what's it called? Let me get a charger so I can get it charging. Sure. All right. So anyway, um, I I after after a few minutes, Kaisa came. So when Kaisa came, I told the security people to let him in. So they allowed him to come in, you know. And when 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 we were going in the metal detector, saw uh, Kaiser's uh, gun. I didn't even know that there was a gun in the bag. You get it? Right. Yes, I didn't know there was a gun in the bag. So they saw they saw the gun, and. <laughs> And they said to me, hey, make, a, make a lie. We saw a gun in your bag, you know. And I'm like, what? They said, yes. I said, oh, that's not mine. It's, uh, Kaiser's, it's Kaiser's bag, you know. And they said, where is Kaiser? And I said, he, I said he's coming. And just, he didn't even take two minutes. Kaiser came, you know. So that's uh, exactly what happened. But there were police over there. They told, they told the police, they told the police that they found a gun in a Mecca's uh, bag, you know. But Kaiser had already arrived, so 
they took me and Kaiser to the police station. You know, they took Kaiser's gun and Kaiser's, Kaiser showed them his license and they returned the gun to him. That was it. No, no big deal. But you know, we are, we are well-known ex-footballers. So the news went viral all over the world, you know. So it wasn't a big deal. Like, it's just that um, it happened to people like myself and Kaiser. That's the reason. <laughs> right. I mean, well, that's what comes with being a being a well-known personality. Uh, well, but that's yeah. that's more of the uh, negative thing. Now let's uh, talk about the social work you have done with the for the Rohingya refugees in, uh, if I'm not mistaken, 2018, where you had arranged for friendly matches for yeah. them. You were you had you had prepared to run from Kolkata through Bangladesh, 1,500 kilometers, and. I think you had uh, Mr. Bhask uh, Bhaskar, the goalkeeper, was also probably involved in that project. So, what was that entire project about? Uh, that was a very <coughs> that was a very um, extraordinary project. That um, I was I was extremely disappointed with. Um, the Muslim communities of uh, India and Bangladesh. Um, I, I intended to raise uh, millions of dollars with that uh, project, uh, you know, to use it to help uh, Rohingya uh, uh, refugees, you know, that are scattered in India and Bangladesh. But, um, Unfortunately, I didn't get the support that I needed from the FUBA families of India and Bangladesh, and also from the Muslim communities of India and Bangladesh. You know, I had already talked to the legendary players all over the world who were ready to come to India and Bangladesh to play uh, two novelty matches in these two countries that would have uh, helped us to raise millions of dollars for these Rohingya refugees. But unfortunately, I got disappointed by the FUBA families of these two countries and also the Muslim communities of these two countries. But I gave it my best, my best shot. And the, the few hundreds of thousands of dollars that I raised, I also gave it to the Rohingya uh, uh, refugees that are in these two, two nations. It was done with the right intention and the fact that you at least uh, achieved something uh, shows that it was a success for sure. Uh, you have, uh, now you're someone who's a globe trotter. So you have played in the professional leagues of is India, Nigeria, Malaysia, Denmark, Hungary, is it uh, Spain, USA, Wales and Peru. Now these are some, these are places all around the world, scattered all around the world. Now how did you adjust to new cultures and new changing rooms and new uh, teammates? Uh, football, football is, um, is the only global sport there is, you know. Uh, um, it, it's one language. Let me put it that way. It's one language. Uh, if, if you go to any country, you, you probably need to learn 12 to 15 words. And that alone, you can use it to communicate with everybody in the football field, you know? And from there, it won't even take you six months and you're speaking the language of that country. You know, so that's the beauty of football. You know, uh, um, football is one language. Uh, uh, no matter how, no matter how odd the language is, once you get into the pitch, everybody's speaking one language. You know, so uh, it was exciting experiences for me to go to all these countries 
play football, not just play, but excel in football. You know, I, I, I really enjoyed it. Right, but uh, football is something you do for a uh, select few hours of the day. Now, how did you adjust to the culture in all the other, other hours of the day? Because that's off the field and that's when, you know, that's when your, your mind is not as occupied because it's not, you're not doing what you love at that time. Okay. Uh, uh, I know, I know when I, when I say the things I say about football, a lot of people don't really understand. My passion for football is is beyond compare. Football is my life. You know, I I don't know how I can explain it in a better way. Okay, let let me let me. Let me say this. I when I when I come from New York New York City to Texas, which is about four hours flight to come into Texas. Sometimes I am in Odessa and from Odessa to Dallas is Nine, mile, uh, nine hours drive. In the weekends, I would drive nine hours just to go and play football in Dallas. And sometimes I'm in Houston. And in the weekends, I would drive from Houston to Austin, which is two hours, 55 minutes drive. I'll drive down there just to play soccer. I can play football in those places, but the ones that I'm going to enjoy in Dallas and in Austin is a much higher level football because there's a lot of foreigners, you know, also Nigerians are playing there. So the quality of the game that they play there is much higher. So I will I would jump in my car and just drive to those places. When, when people hear that, they marvel, you know, why, what would lead a man of my age, remember, I'm no longer playing, playing football professionally, but I still, I am still passionate about the game and I can leave everything that I'm doing just to go and play football, you know? So what football means to me is indescribable, you know? Uh, I, I'm so passionate about football that I can, I can even give my life for the game. I can, there's nothing that I can't profit just to go and play the game. Okay, when I go into the football field to play, that's my sanctuary right there. You know, if I have any worries at all, I don't remember any of them anymore. Yeah. You know, I concentrate on the game and I enjoy it. I have so much fun, you know. So football means a lot to me. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of uh, football fanatics can resonate with your thoughts. And it's incredible that you're st you still take so much effort to play the game. And that's probably why you still look uh, 30 and not like you're about to approach uh, up approach 60. So that's that's really nice. Um, you are, <laughs> yeah. Uh, are you in touch with uh, some of the other uh, legendary foreigners of your time, like Chima Okori and uh, Chibuzor? Um, I'm in touch with Chibuzor. I used to be in touch with Chima Okori, but uh, it's been up to two years since I've talked to him. But Chibuzor, I talk with Chibuzor nearly every two days or something. 
Okay, okay. So is and are you in touch with any uh, any other players, any other foreigners or Indians that you have played with in the I League? Yeah, I'm in touch with a number of uh, Indian legends of football. Moduli Slam, um, Shabir Ali. Uh, I'm in touch with a, a number of them. A okay. lot of them. Yeah. Mm. And now, uh, so we have spoken about uh, MK Iziogo, the player. Now let's go into MK Iziogo, the coach. Uh, you have coached in uh, five countries. As a, and uh, can you tell, tell the world about, give a description of MK, the coach? Um, I think uh, the, the players that I have coached, they can tell a little more about me than what I can say about myself. Uh, um, I bring the same passion that I have for the game when I was playing. I bring that same passion into coaching. And it's, it's hard for me to, to coach without involving myself in the playing part of the game. So... I am coaching and I'm practicalizing my coaching by showing the players what to do, you know? So uh, um, I, I, I think that the, the, the clubs that I have coached and the players also, they can, majority of them can ascertain that they had a wonderful time playing playing for me when I was their coach. I'm sure, sir. certainly, definitely, that's for sure. Uh, another unique thing you've done, you uh, spent time away from football, which must have been very hard for you to pursue a degree in cyber security. What motivated you to go that route? Uh, it's a new world that we live in. <laughs> it's, I mean, what's it called? Um, uh, uh, social media and you know uh, um, uh, what's it called um, everything related to cyber security is going to be around for the next in the next 60 years it's, go, it's still going to be around so the earlier the better great so you're staying moving with time uh, now we want your opinion. We want your opinion on something because you're, I mean, you're the most, um, the most successful player to come out of India because uh, today we have World Cup players who are brought in already to play in the ISL, but you're someone who has made it from the, if, if from the I-League to the topmost level in football. What are your thoughts on the state of, uh, current state of Indian football? The, the, the current state of Indian football is awful, you know, and it's not going to change. Wrong people are managing football in India. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Wrong, wrong people are managing football in, in India. It is the same thing that's going on in Nigeria also. So I cannot be criticizing India without criticizing my own country, you know? Uh, uh, the same thing that's going on in Africa is going on in Asia. It's exactly the same thing. We are quick to locate non-entities in football and bring them to our countries to coach. When we have local coaches, that are better than those foreign coaches or that would add greater value to the team more than those foreign coaches. We ignore those ones and go and bring the foreign coaches. We pay them even more money than we pay the local coaches. You know? And they come in, they don't achieve anything. There is no way that the foreign coaches can take teams of India too. Mm. It doesn't matter even if 
uh, uh, you go and bring Pep, Pep, Pep Guardiola to, to an Indian team, he's not, he's not going to change anything. Great to see that you're an advocate. He lacks the capacity. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. He lacks the capacity to add any value to any Indian team. So the problem with Indian football is we have no regard for our own. Great to see that you're an there advocate are, local coaches. Yes, I, I'm an advocate, a great advocate for local coaches. The local coaches understand the players. They understand the language. They understand the culture. You know? And they can impart the knowledge to the players quicker and in a different way than the foreign coaches. If you bring any foreign coach, there must be an Indian that would interpret whatever he's saying to the players. Right. Yeah. But a local, a local coach would talk directly in the local language to the players. And in a way that they will understand much quicker. Right. So that, that, that is, I, I don't know. Um, look at somebody like me. If the Indian, if the Indian club insists that they must have foreign coaches in Indian team. There's a way to go about it. Right. How many Indian players play abroad? None. Hardly. Hardly any. We need to start taking Indian players to go to play in other countries. So that Indian football can, can grow. Right. There are local players that can also play abroad. You see what's going on with South Korea. Their players are playing in Premier League. They're playing in Spain and all that. It's about time we started taking Indian players to go to play in those countries. Right. There are players with the capacity to do that, but they must be encouraged. Mm -hmm. You know, some of those players of Korea and Japan, China, that plays in Europe, it doesn't mean that they actually qualify to play in those places. You get it. Right. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, but, this is but it is, it, is entirely, it is entirely business. If you bring a Chinese player to England to play in the Premier League, the, the club that he plays for in England makes a lot of money from television in China and South Korea. You know, so it's purely business. You know, and that helps the football of China and South Korea to grow. So we need to start looking at the business side of football. You know, football has moved from entertainment to business, you know. So we need to start thinking about going that far. Can you imagine that since 1986 that I played for East Bengal, Indian clubs do not make one rupee. They do not make one rupee from selling players or selling memorabilia. Right. They are always spending money to buy players, to buy coaches, but they are not selling players and making millions of dollars. They should be doing that. True. So Indian football has been spent, 
spend, spend. No income. Zero income. They need to start looking at the 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 uh, business side of football. Which is why a lot of clubs shut down when they don't have sponsorship. <laughs> India has the capacity. I mean, India is over a billion people. They have the capacity to make billions of dollars from football. So much money. But they have to have the right people running the football team. Right. Well, this is this is a real thought-provoking um, interview, and uh, I'm not going to take too much of your time because I've, I think I've taken an hour of your time already. But one last question, and that question is that: What is Mr. Emeka Iziogo's future plans? What are your future plans? Um, I, 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 I'm, I am looking at actually. Uh, settling, settling in media. That that's the area I'm looking at now in football. I want to settle in the media side of football, you know, uh, uh, because there's a lot that is going wrong in African football and Asian football. You know, these areas are exactly where I belong more. You know, so I think I should go into uh, uh, the media side of football and use that area to impact my world, you know. Mm. That, that's a diverse, that's a quite a different route you're taking. And I really wish you all the success in that. And hopefully you're as successful in the media line as you were as a player, for sure. Uh, this brings us to the Thank end of the interview, Emeka, sir. And uh, this is the first interview that we have taken where starting at 6 a.m. here in India. And we have just concluded it at 7.07. .07. Worth waking up, worth every second. And thank you so much for accepting the invitation to be a part of this interview. Uh, Arches the, is going to be doing the conclusion, the, the thank you note. Thank you, my brother. Appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Emeka, sir, for uh, giving us your valuable time. And I hope uh, many of the uh, questions that people had regarding uh, your national team or your time in India, I'm sure they must have been answered. And I would like to thank Ryan for conducting this amazing interview. Thank you so much.